Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chelsea Bennett. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. We'll give folks a few moments and uh, we will jump in. Happy Tuesday. Happy, happy Tuesday. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm so excited to be with you all here today um on facebook live this is so uh it's such an incredible opportunity to be able to share my journey of running when i was 21 years old uh, for a local elected office but want to start off with a few things so welcome 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 this is never too young to run and again i am chelsea bennett and i ran when i was 21 years old for local office I uh, want to start off by giving uh, some thanks to our sponsors who make this all possible here at the LBJ Women's Campaign School. And so that is the LBJ School of Public Affairs, uh, the TWU Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy, the Texas Business and Professional Women's Foundation, and then the Women's Public Leadership Network. So thank you, thank you to our sponsors for making this happen. Many of you are following uh, LBJ's Women's Campaign School uh, because you're interested in policy. You're interested in maybe one day running for office or even one day uh, being a campaign manager, being involved with policy. And it's, on, it's a part of you and in your heart to have an effect on policy. So I'm excited that you joined us. Um, if you're not familiar with the program, uh, I encourage you to go to the website, learn about the program, apply to their program. Um, if you're interested in running a campaign or running for office, it will be life changing. And when I heard about this uh, campaign school, I said, I wish this school was around when I ran for office 10 years ago. I'm sure that there are things that I could have done much better, uh, yet excited for those of you who will be able to um, apply and gain these skills to run for office and run for campaign. So throughout today's, uh, our time today, I encourage you to uh, put any questions in the chat box that you may have for me. Um, I'm here, I'm looking, this is meant to be a conversation um, and an encouragement to you if you're considering uh, being involved in policy. So let me just start off with who I am, who, who is Chelsea Bennett? Um, and I'll take you back to uh, three decades ago. Uh, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I am, uh, you know, a Floridian, a Southern girl, and I was raised there, lived there the majority of my life. I was born to two teenagers um, in the early part of my life. My father was incarcerated um, and my mom was a single mom. And so there was a lot that I saw in my neighborhood a lot that I wanted to see changed. Um, I did not like seeing some of the things that were going on around me in my neighborhood. Um, I lived um, in a neighborhood that had challenges. Um, and it was one of the things that I saw that always was a part of my drive personally was that I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. I mean, I know we hear this all the time, uh, yet from a very young age, uh, folks would tell me that I was bossy. And I've come to see that as an advantage. You know, I'm not a bossy, I'm a leader. Um, my leadership skills were in development from a very early age, and I was never afraid to speak my mind. And so I started um, being 
engaged and involved with different things in my community at a very early age because I wanted to see impact. I wanted to see change and have impact. Um, and I knew that because of my boldness and my willingness to speak up for other people, that that was a gift that had been given to me by God and that there was a way for me to use it. And so one of the first ways that I used it, obviously, in terms of policy was running for office. And so I ran for office uh, back in 2010, and it was a local office, uh, an uh, office that most people don't even know about. Uh, and that was the Soil and Water Conservation District in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I ran for it because um, earlier in that year, in, well, in 2009, I had studied abroad and I learned about the global water crisis. And I was so interested in being engaged with the environment, being engaged with conservation and what that meant for America, the United States, as well as for the rest of the world. And so I studied in Belgium for about six months, traveled to uh, nine different countries, learning about water. I had the opportunity to create a plan and um, present it to one of the major NGOs over there. And so it was just a life-changing experience. And when I came back, I was asked to run for office. And so initially it was me, you know, why me run for office? Um, I had just graduated college. Um, I didn't have any money, no one knew my name, and I was still trying to figure out life myself. It was, you know, what do I have to contribute? You know, what is it that I have to offer to bring? And I wasn't sure that six months of studying the global water crisis was enough. For undergrad, I was a business management major with a minor in mass comm. And so it was, okay, how is this together? Um, those who know me know that I am type A. So I like for things to kind of make sense. And it wasn't making you know sense or checking every checkbox that I would have wanted it to. Um, but I felt led to to, to run at this time. Um, and it came off of the heels before I had went to Belgium. I ended up going to Belgium my senior year because I had run for student body president throughout um, college. I had been involved in student government, you know, so a senator. I ran the campaigns for the entire student government. Um, you know, I had been involved, I had run campaigns on the, for my college university. Our university was set up similar to um, how politics is today. There was a two party system. And so there was a particular party that I was involved with. And so I ran their campaigns. I was a candidate on their ticket. Um, you know, one of my campaigns, I elected out of the 21 people on my ticket, 20 people got elected. And so, you know, I was engaged. This was what, um, you know, I love doing. I spent more time in student government sometimes than my classes. Um, and so one semester when I got my first C in college, I realized that I also needed to pay attention in school. But I share that background with you is because I decided to run for student body president, but I didn't run with, you know, the party that I had been working with because there were things that were happening that just kind of bothered me to my core of who I who I was and what I stood for. And so I started my own party. I ran and ladies, I lost. <laughs> I lost big. And it was, okay, well, what do I do? And so that took me to studying abroad for six months in Belgium, um, extending my college career by six months, but still one of the best decisions. And so here I am coming, you know, having lost a campus-wide election um, a campus where I was known, a campus where I had invested time, studying abroad, studying water, and then running for office, being asked to run for office at this point. And it was, I was challenged. It was, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so today with sharing this background, I want to dive into three obstacles I had to overcome as a young female um, 
candidate for office. Uh, obviously, you know, the end of the story that I was elected to office. I was elected as the youngest um, female ever elected in Jacksonville, which was super cool. And I didn't find that out till months later. So I was being interviewed for a national magazine, but so many different cool things along the journey. But I want to encourage you today. So one of the obstacles that I had to overcome was name recognition. Listen, you just heard my story and I was not politically connected. Um, I was barely out of college <laughs> running for office. And I just, it was, my name is going on a ballot for Jacksonville, a consolidated city, Duval County. Like, is this even possible? You know, I know it is one of the most obscure offices you could run for, but still, is there even a chance for me to when, you know, is this going to be a repeat of what happened in undergrad? And what I learned, ladies, is that you meet people along the way. Um, and it was truly a grassroots campaign. There was so much that I did myself, so much that was done in kind because people met me and they wanted to support me. And so anyone questioning the name recognition, um, don't let that stop you. Because when you, when people are able to see your heart, your passion, and hear why you want to do what you're running for, that can have a huge impact um, on how you are received by those you are campaigning to. Um, I knew that I was going to be last on the ballot. Right. So this not only name recognition, but knowing that I was going to be the last name on the ballot. And so someone along the campaign trail gave me a slogan had nothing to do with the environmental board, but it did have it was a, my tagline that connected with people. And it was last on the ballot, first in your hearts. And so that's how people came to know Chelsea P. Henry back in Florida in 2010 last on the ballot first in your hearts and it stuck people were saying this slogan this tagline when they met me and so there are different tactics and strategies you can do around name recognition but don't let that stop you make sure that when you go into running and you decide to run or even running a campaign because i've done that as well is know know your why Right. And your why is going to help you through any obstacle that you may um, encounter. The second obstacle that I encountered was resources. So, you know, th there's not many people. There wasn't like a line of people at the door who said, hey, Chelsea, I want to donate to your campaign. Uh, yeah, no, that was not happening. Um, I did raise money. Uh, that was and that helped me to be able to, you know, buy yard signs, bumper stickers. Um, I had a website. Uh, and so there were re there were um, there was monies coming in. But this wasn't, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. It was literally people who met me and who said, hey, here's a here's a twenty five dollar check, you know, because there were other races that were going on during the same exact time all the way up to the governor's race. Um, in Florida. And so, but all those little 25, those $25 checks, those $10 checks, those $5 checks, they added up and they made a difference. And it was one of the resources that helped me. You know, one of the other resources that I lacked in the beginning was some of the support from those closest to me. I still remember when I shared that I wanted to run for this citywide office citywide office and i had some um someone close to me who told me completely that i was crazy and they told me that i was crazy because they said how do you expect to win a citywide office when you just lost an office uh at your university a year ago like the people at the university who knew you didn't vote for you. What makes you think people in a city where no one knows you will vote for you? And it was very hard to hear. Um, it was very, um, it, it impacted my, um, it impacted me, you know, but I didn't let it stop me. But it was one of those things that in the beginning I was lacking. I didn't have all the monies. I didn't have all the support I thought I was going to have. And I 
don't think I've ever shared this publicly, but while I was running for office, um, I was laid off from my job. And so here I am running for an unpaid office, nonpartisan office that I happen to now be have this passion for after studying abroad um, for six months, and I was laid off. And so in this time, I'm also applying to law school um, and I applied to law school, was accepted to law school. And so my life was just completely turned upside down. And the surety of what most people would want when you say I'm going to run for office, I did not always have. But it was an obstacle that I had to overcome. I knew why I was running. I knew the impact that I wanted to make. And that is what drove me in spite of these obstacles. Uh, the third obstacle that is one that I had to work on, especially with the first two obstacles of name recognition and resources, was confidence. Why me? What do I have to offer? Uh, how do I overcome initially not having someone super close to me who I expected to be on my side to 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 go through with this campaign? Um, because for me and because I am, again, type A, I ran a full campaign. It was grassroots, but everything that I could do that resembled, you know, one of the larger campaigns I did, again, a website, social media yard signs, bumper stickers, and typically these were not things you did for soil and water, but I believed in my reasoning and I believed in my why. And my why of running for office was for this particular office was not only to just be a voice, um, that's what has been a thread throughout my policy career, my political career has been to be a voice for the voiceless, but it was because when I was over there in Belgium, I learned how important water is to our society. I learned how it is a thread in our lives and one that we all need to survive. And so coming, you know, and most people who were on the Soil and Water Conservation District who were on the board, you know, they had some type of farming tie. That was not my tie. Um, you know, I've not been on a farm. That's that That wasn't my but for me, my tie was teaching communities, specifically um, minority communities, African-American communities, about the importance of conservation, one for the environment, and then also from a fiscal perspective. And that was the perspective that I brought. I ended up working with the local utility agency to help increase education in the African-American communities. One of the things that I was able to bring to the table as I'm talking about confidence and I didn't you know, just know who I was, was that I was an African-American. And so you know, when I hosted some online teachings, it was they were listening to someone who looked like them. And that was a part of what I had to offer. You know, did I know that months prior? No, but I knew that I wanted to make an impact. And so when you're struggling or if you ever struggle with confidence in your journey, know and remember your why. Um, my even being elect once I was elected to office, there were different challenges even on the board that I had to address. And it was building confidence of I was elected here by over 90,000 votes. People check my name, even if I was the last on the ballot. Some people did it intentionally. Some people just checked it. It was this is where I am. This is where I'm supposed to be. And I now have a duty to represent those who I'm serving, to represent those who I said I wanted to reach. And so the confidence one was definitely a journey, right? I do not want to make that seem like, you know, that was one and done. That was one that I struggled with, but I overcame and I overcame by striving through it, by determining and reminding myself of who I was and my why. And so today, I want to encourage you to think about your why. I want to encourage you to, you know, if you're considering running for office, running a campaign, write down those things that you consider a barrier. 
Um, have them, you know, write them down, know what they are, because if they're in your mind, put them to paper and really take time to look at truths, right? Because you may be feeling a certain way, but that may not be the case. Take some time and talk to someone else about what you see as an obstacle and come up with a game plan, right? Because we need women at the table, right? We need women at every corner of the policy making in this country, in your communities, in your state. And so if that's the campaign, is that if that's the candidate, I am now a lobbyist. So I have went, uh, I'm now looking at policy from a different uh, perspective, but I love policy and making impact because policy affects the lives of people and how they live their everyday lives. And I want to make sure that um, I am able to continue to have impact in a way that it strengthens families, strengthens communities, and allows people to live a life of purpose. So with that, thank you for listening to me share a little bit about my story, um, what I the obstacles I overcame and uh, where I am today. So I, I open it up for questions that you may have. Um, I see I was missing a few comments here. Um, so, but if you have questions, I am here and would love to answer them. Yes, yeah, so great to see. Cecilia, you're interested in the program. I encourage you to apply. As I shared earlier, I wish that I had a program like this. I'm sure that it would have helped me overcome some of my obstacles a little bit quicker or maybe even have a plan in place because I more so kind of just fiddled my way through it. Um, and so if I can do it 21, you all can um you all can do it. And you know, one of the other messages I want to encourage you all to take away is that you may not, the first time may not always be victorious, right? But if you know your why and you fully believe that you are called to be able to have impact, to, to make change in your community, don't give up. Don't give up. Um, and a program like this through LBJ can really help you to fine tune your campaign plan, you know, fine tune your policy areas and help you to really fine tune what it is that you want to do. So, you know, this is this. I was um, not your normal candidate. Um, because call time was not at the top of my list. Um, my donations came in from me uh, chatting with people face to face. Um, and so, you know, the dedicated call time that you would normally see um, in a campaign back in the day, uh, 10 years ago, I had a different route, but you should have call time. You need call time, um, especially, you know, again, I ran for soil and water. If you're looking, if you're looking at a race and you're going to need a substantial amount of money, call time will be needed. <laughs> Let me be very clear. I see another question here. Um, what was the most personal milestone that helped you grow internally? Um, for me, the greatest experience of my life has been was when I went overseas to Belgium for those six months. It was my first time out of the country, first time away from home. When I I, I love Belgium, it was uh, I lived in a dorm with sixteen other people. I was the only person who was not fluent in French. Um, it was the first time for me that I you know shared a bathroom with people who were not family. And that experience just changed my life. It helped me to really see what it meant. Uh, you know, we always back in 10 years ago, one of the key phrases was a global marketplace. Um, and, and I had been working in corporate America before I went overseas. And it was I really was able to see face to face and be and spend time with people about learn about what it meant to have this global perspective, to understand that not the way that we did things here in the United States was not the way that everyone else always uh, always did things. And it just grew me, it stretched me. 
um, through my travels. There were some times that I traveled in groups. There were other times I traveled alone. And so it really helped me to build this awareness of, you know, who am I? And so to gain experience meeting people, learning how to communicate when I wasn't fluent in the language. And so, again, that was the greatest experience of my life. Um, I see another question. Thank you for the questions. Do you have a golden rule for balancing your personal life and running for office being an elected official? Yes. Oh, my. Um, I, I may have few golden rules. Um, first, you know, I I encourage you to look at your your life. Right. For me at the time, I was single. Um, you know, again, freshly out of college. So there were I didn't have as many demands as some people running for office. You know, some ladies, you all have a husband. You all have kids. Like if I ran for office now, it would be a totally different landscape. But first, evaluate your landscape. What is my landscape? Put in some boundaries. If I could have a golden rule, it is boundaries. What are your boundaries? Because as I continued along for the three years that I served on soil and water, um, and I began to do things statewide and nationally, politically, um, with the work that I was doing, and it was in this, what are my boundaries? Because if when I didn't have boundaries, I just found myself working all the time. And it is so important for us as women to remember that we must take care of ourselves. And so, you know, if you happen to be single right now, you will have more time to dedicate to your campaign, to your elected office. But maybe you're married or maybe you're married and kids or maybe you're a single mom. You can still be an excellent servant leader with other responsibilities, yet having those boundaries will help you to be able to lead, will help you be able to uh, look back later and say how when because I like to evaluate myself, how can I evaluate myself? But it's going to be with the help of boundaries. So thank you for that question. Um, and what's important, you know, one of the things for me when I was running for office and when I was elected was uh, making sure that I continue uh, staying connected from a spiritual perspective. Uh, my faith is so important to me. And so it was important that I stay, you know, connected to my church, to my family, because the campaign trail can be it can be grueling. It can be draining. It can be, you know all the things you wish will never happen, those things can be one of the things that happened to me along the campaign trail in the final hours was that I was running for a nonpartisan race, you know, again, the last one on the ballot uh, back in Jacksonville. Um, one of the things that's popular or was popular then, I now live in Virginia, um, but was popular then was um, the vote what they would call, you know, um, vote cards, cheat cards that, you know, uh, they would list out who you should vote for. And in the last hour, um, one of the major, you know, vote cards, uh, I was not selected. My opponent was selected, um, who no one ever saw. Um, but my opponent was selected because of some of my politics that uh, was not accepted by those who were doing the who were leading the uh, the vote cart. And the interesting thing that was one of the reminders for me is to know that sometimes when you have different politics than people believe differently on different things, that that can that can be a deal breaker for how they interact with you, or at least for a certain time. And so it was a few days before the election. These cards went out and people literally would, whatever that vote card said, that's what they would do. And so in the last hour, I was in law school at this time, I pulled together a few of my new, newly, you know, uh, colleagues, classmates, and sent them out to some of the high traffic early voting stations, created a little flyer that had my card on it because these vote cards were my were sent out in the minority communities had my picture on it shared a little bit about me and asked them people to vote for me and literally had classmates passing these out because i had to overcome this vote card that was being sent out to thousands of people 
and I wasn't selected at the last minute because of some of my uh, political choices. And so it was it, it was a curveball. And those are going to happen. Things that you think that will not happen. Um, because for me, what I was told was that the vote cart was not going to select anybody because they, the people who were organizing it, which was a one of the lead people was a former um, United States Congresswoman, um, didn't agree with all my politics. And instead of going with not choosing uh, me or my opponent, they chose my opponent. And so it was a huge curveball. And um, I can think back to that moment and it was just like, oh my gosh, 10 months of campaigning, could this one card change everything I've done? And so while I freaked out for a moment, it was, okay, well, what am I going to do? Because I'm too close to give up um, and I'm too close to, you know, just call it quits. And so obviously, um, it was a closer vote than it probably would have been because of those cards, but I still pulled out on top. Next question, uh, what were the stages during your campaign you felt least prepared for and how did you overcome those points from a logistical perspective with your team? Um, well, I mean, as I was sharing earlier, uh, confidence and preparation was an issue was, a, you know, an obstacle for me from the beginning. And so when I think about being least prepared, I think that one of the things I was least prepared for was fundraising. So when I that question earlier about call time, call time needs to be a priority. You need money to run a race, um, even for my small grassroots campaign. I needed money. And so fundraising was an issue. And then the other for me, one of the other challenges that I had to work through was, you know, this again, I was running for an unpaid position. So some folks thought I was crazy for running a camp, a full campaign, but it was working through um, and prioritizing the groups that I went to meet with, the groups that I spoke to, the radio interviews, you know, in the beginning, especially as a 21 year old, it's like, oh my gosh, everybody wants to interview me. You know, they want to know why I'm running, but I needed help from folks on my campaign to help me to prioritize them and know that you don't. And one of the things I had to learn was that you don't always have to say yes, just because someone asks you. And so that was something that they helped me with um, and the team was very, um, they learned to be very direct with me of saying, hey, Chelsea, this is a radio show that you just don't need to do. Or Chelsea, this is one you need to do. And this is the angle. And that helped me because, again, you know, as I talked about with um, obstacle number one, name recognition, that also came with knowing the political landscape around um, the race and what was happening. I see Claire's comment, women at any stage of life are no less qualified to run or serve than men. You are absolutely right. And that's again, why I think that, you know, having some boundaries in place, and of course, sometimes those boundaries are gonna get pushed a little bit, but having those boundaries are going to just help lay a foundation so that, you know, if you say from the time of five to seven, I'm with my kids, then you are with your kids, you know? And so, but I love that reminder, Claire, of yes, you're no less qualified. If any, that's an additional qualification because you have a perspective, you have experience that, you know, if you're a mom, you have an experience that I don't have that you'll be able to bring to the campaign trail. And then if you're elected, that you'll be able to bring to office as policies are being discussed and eventually voted on. What lesson did you learn about team management both during campaign and while in office? I learned, uh, this is a, I, I, I pause because this was one that was so great for me to begin to learn. It was a journey, but to give people grace, right? Because you know, people who were working on my campaign, I had a volunteer who committed to my campaign and was there, who who helped, who, who, who she was my right hand. And, and what I had to, what I began to learn then, again, I was 21, that was 10 years ago, I've learned so much more um, in my leadership style, management style, 
was one, give people grace, right? And so I had to give her grace of not everyone is going to move at the speed that I think they should move in. Not everyone is going to do things the way that I think that they should do them, which leads to another point, which is be open to the thoughts of others. Sometimes as a candidate, and I've seen this being on a campaigns as well, um, helping candidates is that you become so um, focus on your campaign, which is great. But don't forget that the people who have signed up to help you, who have made the sacrifice of time, resources, whatever it may be, they are there for you. And to be open to other ideas, to be open to other ways of doing things, because your team is going, they, they should be the people that you trust. They should be the people that you lean on, but they should also be the people that you listen to. It doesn't mean that you're going to take their advice all the time or do, but you want to make sure that your campaign team feels involved. Uh, they feel engaged, especially your senior level people. And so if there's anything that I could go back 10 years ago, it would be I would have asked some of those who were helping me on the campaign. I would have asked them more. What do you think? Do you think there's a better way to do this? Do you think that you want to take over the website? You know, I would have asked for their opinions, their insights um, more because they were the ones who made sacrifices, again, to volunteer, to donate, you know, not only their time, but resources and making connections to engage them more. Well, any other questions? I thank you all so much for having me today, for allowing me to um, share my story, share um, my, my journey from, you know, how I grew up to running for office, you know, being a candidate, being elected. You know, now I am based in Virginia, um, in the Richmond, Virginia area. I am a lobbyist for a national public health organization. And then I have my own women's ministry, Life with Chelsea, where I host a weekly um, podcast called Chats with Chelsea, as well as we have a nonprofit arm where we assist uh, new and expecting moms facing difficulties with, uh, you know, supplies and resources. And so for me, policy has always been a thread of my life. And now I've been able to see where policy can take you. Um, one of the things that I did not share that just may be helpful as you all are learning my journey. And so I, when I served for three years in a, as an elected official, and then I actually went to the state capitol in Florida and I served a statewide elected official um, for about five years. And so, you know, I have seen the many different ways that you can have impact in policy. OK, I see another question before we close out. Um, out of curiosity, how were you able to overcome presumptions that youth is automatically tied to lack of um, experience and capacity? That's an excellent question. One of the things I did was I just did it. Whenever there was an event, I was there. Um, you know, so much so that when I um, began working for the statewide elected official, I met that elected official on the campaign trail, right? And so and he, my former principal, he hired me in law school, um, brought me to the Capitol after I graduated. I did the work. And because it may be a presumption about your age, it may be a presumption depending on where you're running, what you're running from, because you are a woman. It could be because of your race and ethnicity. Um, it could be because of so many different things. It, you know, there could be presumptions because of what your former occupation was. Listen, show them who you are, right? You can tell them, have the speeches, the radio interviews, but show them. And one of the things that I can look back and say I'm proud of is that I gave my campaign my all, even up to the last minute when those vote cards <laughs> went out and my opponent's name was checked on it. I gave it my all. I showed up. And so 
encourage yourself. You'll hear me say the word, you've heard me say the word encourage a lot because I, I like to be optimistic. I like to give my all. And again, it doesn't always turn out the way you want it to be, but you want to be able to look back and say, I gave my all. So whatever the presumption is, you decide in your heart that you're not going to allow that to stop you or to hinder you. And there is, you know, I, I think it's limitless of what you will be able to accomplish because you'll take off those barriers that people are trying to put on you um, and to be able to accomplish what it is that you set out to do, because you'll be able to remind yourself of your why and move from there. Uh, you know, there's also a that's the encouraging side from a practical side of it. You want to think about your talking points. You want to think about what events you do show up at. You want to think about the interviews that you do. You want to think about the verbiage that you use in your social media posts. Those are all things that you can do from a strategic perspective when you're thinking about when you think about overcoming uh, presumptions that are in your control. They're just going to be some that people are going to think regardless. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of showing people um, versus always trying to tell them or convince them. Okay, see some more comments. Um, thank you, Virginia. Awesome. Well, with that, we have had an awesome conversation today. Thank you for joining me. Please apply to the LBJ Women's Campaign School. If there's any questions I can answer offline, you can find me um, at lifewithchelsea.com. And uh, yes, I hope you're encouraged to, as Rebecca said, to, to overcome any obstacles you face um, as you are looking to run for office or run a campaign. But I remain a resource to you, happy to help because we need you at the table. Thank you all so much and I hope you have a great day.